Well, hello everyone. I'm David Kennedy, a former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West at Stanford. And I'd like to welcome you all to this second installment of our COVID era three-part all virtual uh, State of the West Symposium. Uh, State of the West is a Lane Center initiative. This is our eighth year of doing it. We annually address the issues concerning the fiscal and economic health of our region. Previous topics have included health policy and immigration, water markets, energy infrastructure, and other subjects that are central to the life of us in the Western region. This year, as in, with so many things, we're doing business a little bit differently. We've partnered with the Hoover Institution here at Stanford to present a symposium on COVID in the West last January 28th. Uh, our traditional partner in this initiative, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, uh, will sponsor the third and last of this year's uh, virtual symposia on May 13th, uh, when the topic will be water and energy issues. And panelists on that occasion will include Stanford's own Sally Benson, the former director of the Precord Institute for Energy, and uh, Felicia Marcus, who's now also a Stanford, but is the former head of the California State Water Resources Board. So I'd like to note that we are providing closed captioning uh, for this program and also that the event is being recorded and will be distributed to all registrants uh, later on if they so wish to tune in or repeat later. Uh, please also note that you can submit questions uh, during the course of the discussion using the Q&A function uh, on Zoom and we'll do our best to uh, honor as many questions as feasible. So today our subject <coughs> is wildfire. Uh, and if we need any reminder how timely this is, this morning's news in my household brought the news that Mount Rushmore is closed to visitors today because of fires in South Dakota. And a, a news item that appeared within minutes of that news item told us that Congress is about to consider year-round funding for firefighters who have mostly been seasonal employees uh, in years past. So wildfires have burned in this region since time out of mind. Uh, but their intensity and frequency and social and economic impacts have increased dramatically in recent years, uh, giving rise to a new term in the English language coined by our panelist Stephen Pine, who tells us we are now living in the Pyrocene. So today's discussion will proceed in two parts. The first will address the causes and costs of wildfire, and the second will discuss the challenges of fire management policy going forward. So here I'd just like to extend a warm Stanford welcome to our panelists, as well as a warm thanks to them for being part of our program today. Our lead off presenter in this first of the two panel discussions today is Steve Pine. He's an emeritus professor of, uh, at, San at, <laughs> at Arizona State <laughs> University. He is a fire historian. Indeed, it might be said he's the scholar who could be said to have created the field of fire history and a former member of the fire crew North Rim Longshots. Uh, he's also the author, among many other things, of Between Two Fires, A Fire History of Contemporary America. Uh, Kimiko Barrett is our second speaker in the first session today. She is the lead wildfire research and policy analyst at Headwaters Economics, a nonpartisan independent research organization based in Bozeman, Montana, with which the Lane Center has had the privilege of working on other occasions. And our third speaker in this first panel today is Dr. Kari Nado. She is the director of the Sean Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research and professor and section chief, Allergy and Asthma at Stanford Medical School. She is a leading expert in adult and pediatric immunology, allergy, and asthma. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve Pine, who will get us started. Steve? Well, good afternoon, and thanks for the invitation. I'd like to start the uh, modern history of 580 census map. That's what fire looked like, forest fire looked like in the US then. Uh, it consolidates three kinds of fire, nature's fire, lightning. Lightning is very prominent in the West, but also in places like Florida and elsewhere. Most of what we see in the burning, however, is a result of people, is a traditional um, uses. And then, the third factor, the great disturbance in the force coming into the future is the burning of fossil fuels, conveniently here dividing the world in half. In many ways, the US was the Brazil of its day, uh, many of the same kinds of issues. 
uh, and there were a lot of bad burns. We had mega burns, uh, an order of magnitude larger and more lethal than what we've seen in recent decades. And this inspired uh, the state to intervene in a program of conservation. Uh, this was a global project in India as well as the Northern Rockies. Uh, part of the strategy was to create forest reserves. And in 1905, the US Forest Service took over that administration. Its uh, founder, Gifford Pinchot, had already identified the fight against fire as akin to that against slavery. The origin moment, however, begins with the great fires of 1910, the big blow up, three and a quarter million acres or more burned in the Northern Rockies, 78 firefighters died in the blow up, six different incidents. Uh, the Forest Service was deeply traumatized. It was also put a million dollars in debt, which was real money. Uh, and politically uh, challenged. There was a second political challenge came out of Northern California the same month, August. And this was a, a group that proposed that the whole approach to forest management was misguided. What we should be doing is emulating the American Indian and practicing what was called light burning, regular routine burning. These are some samples uh, from the period. So uh, that controversy was already in motion. Um, I suppose <laughs> we keep repeating ourselves. It would not be until the 1920s, well into the 1920s, the light burning was finally suppressed. Uh, the event uh, deeply impressed future chiefs, three of whom were personally on the fire line. It was a kind of Valley Forge or Long March experience for them. And then Congress in 1911 passed the Weeks Act, which created a federal state program for forestry, uh, which centered on fire control. So over the next 50 years, the Forest Service is pretty much a hegemon and it, uh, per, uh, it adopts and pursues a policy of uh, total fire exclusion. Uh, and it did it with great zeal, great innovation, um, almost a, a fanaticism, but there were limits to what you can do. Much of the backcountry was really inaccessible and there was another kind of backcountry, all that cut over and burned over land that had been abandoned. What would we do with these? What we did was the New Deal, uh, which committed great resources, political as well as financial. Uh, the CCC created an infrastructure for firefighting, even in the backcountry, almost overnight, and bequeathed us uh, our modern fire crews. And then fire goes to war. World War II was in many ways a fire war, the rediscovery of incendiary weapons. Even Japan launched uh, fire balloons against the US and the war, of course, ends with a new incendiary weapon. This is not, by the way, the photo of the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima. This is the pyrocumulus cloud from the burning city. This got the military interested in fire gets folded into national defense, civil defense and national security. Uh, and to replace the CCC, lots of war surplus equipment is made available on a priority basis to the Forest Service and we go to war on fire. In a sense, a cold war on fire, the other red menace. Even Hollywood gets into the uh, picture with essentially war movies uh, with fire as the context. But it can't last. And by the 1960s, along with other kinds of ferments in the country, uh, that hegemony will, will be broken. Uh, we have, in a sense, a kind of fire revolution. We'll find new policies with an effort to restore good fire instead of indiscriminately taking out all fires and new institutions, interagency, intergovernmental and a civil society will all come into play to change the institutional dynamic at work. Uh, the revolution had two poles, bipolar in a certain sense, one in Florida, uh, which emphasized prescribed burning and the other in California, which was particularly interested in natural fire. And for about uh, 16 years or so, the revolution uh, proceeds. 1968, the National Park Service reforms its policy. 1978, the Forest Service does. By then, the Nature Conservancy is burning as much as the National Park Service. These are not new issues. Policy issues in some ways were resolved 40 to 50 years ago. The question was, why haven't we seen more results? Well, what happens is the 1980 elections a Reagan administration is interested in rolling back many of the environmental reforms and government uh, presence generally. 
It isn't enough to eliminate the revolution, but it is enough to stall it. And we have a lost decade, uh, which ends with two spectacular uh, fires at the two extremes, if you will, of what will be the defining landscapes. One Yellowstone, the wild, the purely wild landscape in 88, and then Oakland, the first major urban conflagration since San Francisco burned in 1906 and 1991. Change of administrations, the revolution rekindles, uh, particularly after the South Canyon fire in Colorado, 94, that burned over uh, a crew of uh, firefighters and stunned uh, the fire community. Uh, the following year, we have a federal uh, common fire policy, which is still in operation. In 2000, major breakdowns, this time suggesting the fire community was unable to do what it said it could do, fight fires and light them. Uh, 90 years after the big blow up, we can't contain fires in the Northern Rockies. And the Park Service lights a, a fire in Northern New Mexico that goes feral and burns into Los Alamos National Lab. So in the waning hours of Clinton administration, a national fire plan is uh, promulgated, but that requires uh, the succeeding administrations to follow up. In effect, what happens, we have more big fires, now called mega fires, we have more communities burning, we have more firefighters being killed. So we spent 50 years trying to take fire out of the landscape, and then we've spent 50 years trying to put good fire back in, and I think that second era is closing out and we're evolving into something that we might call a resilience model. So each of these eras has a strategy behind it, which is still very much in play. Uh, suppression is stronger than ever, and there are uh, deep political pressures to make it an all-hazard emergency service. In effect, take an urban fire service model and project it over the landscape. If you want to see what that looks like, CAL FIRE, I think, is a pretty good approximation. But the 50 years of the fire revolution, a restoration strategy are still very strong, trying to get ahead of the problem, change the context, whether they're good fires or bad fires, they're fires that we can deal with, create fire adapted communities, fire resilient ecosystems. We are, we've proven unable, however, to do that at scale. And then the resilience, I think the last 10 years, most fire officers don't believe we're gonna get ahead of the problem. There are just too many things coming at us too fast, too few of them uh, the fire community has any control over. And what we're seeing are all kinds of administrative mashups and hybrid models where a same fire may, be, may involve uh, high intensity suppression, at the same time drawing a big box and burning out a kind of prescribed burn done under urgent conditions. Um, in effect, we're managing wildfires. So they're all in play and which one at any one moment, it's like a game of rock, scissors, paper. So finally, what about climate change? Mega fires have now joined our forlorn polar bear as an emblem of uh, global change, particularly climate. Well, climate is certainly acting as a performance enhancer, but it's not the whole story. Fossil fuels, however, mostly are because they have changed how we live on the land, what kinds of power we get, how we organize our agriculture, our rural landscapes, our wildlands, as well as climate change. And they made fire exclusion possible, at least for a while. Take away our machines and we wouldn't be able to do much firefighting. So we had a fire crisis that was already in, in way well before climate change came on uh, the horizon. But now thanks to that, I think we're entering a fire epoch or what David graciously uh, calls after me a piracy. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll yield to Kimmy. Okay, here we go. I'm assuming everybody can, David, you guys can hear me okay? Full speed ahead. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Steve. Uh, my name is Kimmy Barrett. I am the lead researcher uh, and wildfire policy analyst at Headwaters Economics. And what I want to do here in the next 10 minutes or less is really build off of what Steve has just said and set the context and understanding for what these wildfire risks imply currently, and then perhaps more importantly, where they suggest we're going to go in the future. So with that, let's take a look at this. What are we talking about with the wildfire problem here in the West? And I think Steve has done a really great job setting up the stage for this. Well, we know wildfires are increasing in duration, severity, and frequency. At the same time, however, more people are building in wildfire prone lands. 
driving up both the risks and the costs at the local, state, and federal scale. We also know that wildfire season is indeed getting longer. This was referenced earlier with David and came out in a 2015 study in which here in the West, the wildfire season has been extended roughly 84 days or about three months. This is also illustrated at the global scale in which the wildfire season has been extended about 20%. So fall is lasting a little bit longer and spring is coming a little bit earlier. In addition to that, wildfires are getting more severe. Notice I said that wildfires aren't getting necessarily bigger. This is relative to what we're talking about. You know, compared to the 1970s, yes, wildfires are bigger, but as Steve Pine has said earlier, historically, this is still much smaller than what we've seen in the past. However, what is increasing is the number of acreages burned by highly severe wildfires. In fact, since 1985, the percent of, home, of acres burned by highly severe wildfires has increased by 700% which of course is being driven by increasingly drier and warmer conditions. What's happening? Well, as a result of this, structural losses are increasing, meaning the damage and loss to homes and properties. From 2005 to 2020, nearly 90,000 structures were lost by wildfires. This is a conservative count. Many of those have been in California, such as the campfire in 2018, in which nearly 18, well, more than 18,000 structures were lost in that event alone. As a result of that, of course, insurance claims are rising. So 2018 was particularly devastating with $24 billion submitted in insurance claims. However, in 2020, California alone accounted for $20 billion in insurance claims. And this is really indicative of increasing risks because up until recently, more insurance claims were submitted for leaking washing machines than they were for increasing wildfire risks. So we're starting to see this trend across the board. Unfortunately, this also means that there's more people dying. So in the 1970s, on average, there are about nine fatalities with respect to firefighting deaths. And in the 2000s, this increased to 19. Unfortunately, in the 2018 campfire event, we saw 88 civilian losses alone. So this means increasing danger. Suppression costs are also rising. And we've heard this in many media reports for many, many years. Suppression costs mean the cost to contain and extinguish a wildfire event. These are the costs that are spent by the federal land management agencies which substantially rise in correlation with the presence of homes. In fact, they're 10 times more or greater when a home is present than when fought in the, in the back country. On average, suppression costs have more than doubled since 1999 and now average around $65 million per wildfire. Unfortunately, suppression costs are actually a very small component of the much larger wildfire budget when you start to look at the long-term expenses and damages that accrue in the many months and years following a wildfire event. So long-term costs, for example, actually account for most of the wildfire budget, 65%. This comes in the form of rehabilitation efforts, lost property and tax revenue, infrastructure repairs, stabilization activities, and unfortunately, human casualties. Suppression costs, again, are less than 10%, and then short-term expenses in the form of evacuation and relief efforts account for about 35%. And then when you think about who is paying for these, many of the costs are actually borne at the local community level. Again, these are the expenses that come in the many months and years following a wildfire. So we're talking about homeowners, local municipalities, nonprofit groups, and businesses that pay for a vast portion of those wildfire costs. State and local entities pay for about 17% of wildfire costs. The federal government pays for 12%, mostly in the form of suppression. And then other groups at that national scale, including relief agencies and insurance companies, pay for about a quarter of all wildfire costs. So what do the trends indicate for the future? Well, as referenced by Steve earlier, unfortunately, the problem is likely to, be, to get worse. And this is due to a number of converging trends. Warming climate, for one thing. In fact, climate change has now accounted for more than half of the increase in acreages burned since 1985. Western forests on, as a whole are 75% drier than they have been historically. And this larger fire increase is tied directly to an earlier snow melt and a longer fire season suggesting that all of these trends are going to rise in the future. Denser forests, again, due to very successful suppression efforts to contain and extinguish wildfires, really since the early 20th century onwards, we have a century of accumulated fuel buildup in many of these forests. This leads to younger trees and the infill and accumulation of dead debris that has traditionally been burned through wildfire events 
that now by excluding those wildfires from occurring has led to this buildup. This makes, of course, firefighting much more dangerous and precarious. More humans starting wildfires to start with. So in fact, wildfires that occur up against homes and communities known as wildland urban interface are mostly started by people. 97% of all those fires have been started by humans. This is also 30 times more likely to threaten structures than lightning caused fires. And then lastly, as I referenced earlier, there's more homes in general being built in harm's way, largely referenced as the wildland urban interface or technically defined as the area where homes in the built environment start to intermingle with wildland vegetation and forested landscape. In fact, the wildland urban interface or the WUI as the acronym says, is the fastest growing land use type in the country and accounts for more than a third of all homes. Presently, half of the population in the West now lives in these wildfire prone lands. Well, unfortunately, wildfires we do know are indeed inevitable, again, as Steve has pointed out, and that these risks are increasing into the future. And this is only a small glimpse of the much broader socioeconomic impacts that the next panelists will be talking about. However, we do know how to do things better. We know how to build smarter, safer homes in wildfire prone areas and how we can prevent urban conflagrations and wildfire disasters. And in fact, we can create fire adapted communities by thoughtfully and deliberately thinking about how we envision living alongside the inevitability of wildfires and these increasing risks. So that's me. And with that, I am very honored to be able to turn the panel over to Kari. Thank you. So um, my name is Kari. I'm excited to join my fellow uh, speakers today. And thank you so much for inviting me here today. I work at Stanford as a professor and healthcare worker, and I've been working a lot alongside of those individuals that have been exposed to wildfires. So I'll just talk quickly through the uh, increase in wildfires that have already been spoken about today. But again, just hitting on the head this issue that wildfires are not just in the West anymore. I understand this is a land center for the West Symposium, and that's important. But what we do here, what policies we make here, will have an impact around the world, because this is not just a West issue. This is occurring throughout the world and the Paracene age is apropos. What I also want to talk about is the fact that we have these cumulative conditions that are increasing. And oftentimes we look at maps and look at NOAA and understand what is going on at any one time, but we're gonna see these increasing. And why is that important? Because people and flora and fauna are affected by these. Again, as Kimmy mentioned, um, these fires are mostly caused by humans. Uh, and you can see here in the recent PBS NewsHour um, chart from September 2020, most of them are caused by power lines, unfortunately, in California. So what is in smoke? And I just want to get into these details because that's important when we talk about how smoke affects health. There are over 200 toxins in wildfire. And what happens is if that wildfire smoke, like this past August, it was just laying on top of the whole Bay Area because we were encircled by wildfires. It was this orange hue that got different in coloration as we move forward in days. And that's because literally the sun is shining on that smoke from the other side of the atmosphere and creating chemical changes. So there's this initial output of 200 toxins, but because of the horizontal and vertical aspects of the plumes of wildfires, and depending upon their intensity of heat, you're actually creating new chemistry and new toxicants over time. So as you move forward in time, and if you can't evacuate your home and you think that somehow it's getting better over time, it might not be, because unfortunately the chemicals sight on scene are going to be affecting uh, the uh, health of individuals. So when you look actually under the microscope, and this is electron microscopy, there's particulate matter that's about 2.5 microns or higher. There's soot balls, and that's really important here, like these little piles of soot that unfortunately get up in the air and they trap the warmth in. So the wildfires themselves have an impact in global warming. And then there's microplastics, unfortunately. You can consider wildfires not so wild anymore. As Kimmy was mentioning, there's also residences and commercial buildings that are getting on fire. And unfortunately that's creating, you could imagine in underneath your sink, uh, Drano, uh, dishwasher fluid, soap, this all gets up in the air, plastics, volatile organic compounds, heavy metals, and uh, any kind of nitrogen oxide species. So with that in mind, what are some of the levels of the smoke that we need to worry about? Well, let's talk about sort of the big picture, which is what happened 
in California? What happened locally? We know that during the campfire, for example, particulate matter of 2.5 microns or less, which is very small particles that go all the way down into your airway and the alveoli, they exceeded 200 micrograms per meters cubed. And the typical level, for example, is nine. And that's like smoking about eight to 10 cigarettes, depending on who you are. But that's really unfortunate that people are exposed to that much uh, in terms of PM2.5 and even higher if you're a firefighter. So that corresponds to very unhealthy exposures. Let's go from San Francisco and now to the West. This is really important to look at, based on census blocks, the increase in the number of smoky days. I was recently interviewed by a New York Times reporter and he asked me, well, how many smoky days have increased over time? And I thought that was a really interesting question. And so when you actually look at certain areas of California and the West, you can see the map 2006 to 2010 compared to 2016 to 2020. So a bioinformatist in my lab did this work, but you can see the extent to which more of the West is being covered by over 140 days per year of smoky days from wildfires. And it's not just the West, our smoke, and this is an example of Sonoma County, our smoke goes across the country and for example, to Boston in this particular map. So we are not alone. The Australian wildfires, for example, circumvented the whole world before getting back to the other side of Australia. So there are short-term and long-term health consequences because of the exposure of this smoke. And what you can't see or smell can harm you, unfortunately. So you have particulate matter. I showed you in that electron microscopy image. But importantly is most of the higher level, the larger particulates can go down into the trachea. They're still toxicants, but it's the smaller volatile organic compounds, the things that we can't see, the things that we can't smell, the small particles that are so small they go into an alveoli. Those are the troublemakers that can then get picked up by the circulatory system. They induce heart attacks, they induce strokes in the elderly, they induce allergy exacerbations, they induce worsening of autoimmune disorders, they increase the risk of diabetes, and in the brain they increase stress and post-traumatic stress disorder just alone as a wildfire, but they could also be affecting brain function. They have been shown to lead to lung cancer deaths in people like firefighters that are exposed to them over the long term. So this is just a picture of all the issues that develop after you breathe in wildfire smoke. And anyone that's exposed to wildfire can have health effects, but it's those that are in the underserved area with less access to evacuation procedures, with less access to healthcare, those that already have a heart or lung disease, those people that are older, over 65, have a much higher rate of strokes and heart attack during wildfires, even after just four days of a wildfire, and that's even 100 miles away from where the major wildfire is occurring. Children are at high risk. A recent paper was just published from my colleagues in San Diego showing that children are two times more likely to get with only one wildfire exposure. So here's some of the data. If people are interested, there's a lot of publications on the increase in asthma in areas even within 200 mile radius of a wildfire. And um, that's been proven in many different countries. Unfortunately, it doesn't take a lot of exposure, even just 70 micrograms per meter cubed to be able to be associated with an increase in asthma. This is even higher than what we were exposed to here in the Bay Area recently with our wildfires. And across the West, these numbers are rising. Heart attacks are increasing and stroke admissions, as I mentioned. So those are the short-term effects. Long-term effects are largely unknown. We have the lifespan of firefighters that we know are exposed continually and controlling for all other variables. Lifespan typically is reduced by 10 to 15 years compared to non-firefighters. So this is some data and I just wanna show you this because this is 12.7 million people across California, around 112 hospital visits. You can see here, this is a paper that was published in 2016, but the increase in asthma was relatively much higher after exposure, even to just 80 uh, levels, 80 micrograms per meters cubed of PM2.5. So when we talk to the public and when we give lectures like this, a lot of people ask me, 
what are some of the differences in this color scheme that I get on the map when you go on the websites and you want to understand is something dangerous or not in your community, you're given this map of different colors. But we just want to make sure you know that those roadmaps, those colors are not necessarily proven to be unhealthy or healthy. Yellow, for example, moderate might actually be quite unhealthy for an elderly person, whereas it might be okay for someone who's younger. So we really don't know exactly how unhealthy these exposures are, but we should be extremely careful and conservative. So one of the things we've been doing with uh, the Lane Center for the West, we've been working together with students. Kate is pictured over on the right-hand side, is an was an undergraduate who worked in Lane Center for the West and our group at Stanford. And we looked at people that were exposed to prescribed burns versus wildfires. And why is this important? Well, you heard from Kimmy as well as Stephen today about the fact that if we can control the undergrowth, if we can clean out our forests so that they're less dense, that might help. But our California Air Resources Board has actually severely limited the amount of days that we can actually have prescribed burns in California. And there's a lot of local uh, thought or belief that prescribed burns are somehow not healthy for someone. But what we did was actually study that. And with prescribed burns, what is very helpful to know is that the communities are told ahead of time, they're allowed to evacuate within certain timeframes, and we tested people during prescribed burns, during a wildfire, or controls that were not exposed to smoke at all. And what you see here is that the prescribed burn individuals are very similar to the controls on the whole, and that it's really important to know that they didn't have the same immune changes as those exposed to a wildfire, for example. Finally, we're doing studies with firefighters. We're really thankful for collaborating and partnering with firefighters around the West. And we're looking at active firefighter cohorts, people that have just been recruited versus those that are recently retired that would be more aligned with chronic exposure study cohorts. Finally, how can we mitigate harm? A lot of my patients ask me, what can I do? This is becoming more and more frequent in our society, unfortunately. So of course, for those that have access, they can relocate, but unfortunately many people can't do that. And the wildfires go so quickly, burning at almost a football field a second, for example, in the Paradise Fires, there is no ability to relocate in time. You can close doors and windows, but unfortunately that doesn't necessarily um, allow you to have less exposure. You can stay indoors. However, if you are an underserved immigrant worker that has to work outside, that's not an option. And so wearing a face mask is a potential, but the masks aren't necessarily helpful. They can reduce emissions at some point, but they're not perfect in terms of reducing particulate matters. There really is no safe distance from a wildfire. They can um, allow the use of masks and somewhat decrease exposure, but importantly is there's not enough masks for everyone and for children, the masks don't adequately fit. Finally, you can put indoor filters in your home. We recommend MERV 13, although that reduces airflow. And this is not enough to really be able to accommodate for the exposures that one uh, has. This does not reduce volatile organic compounds, for example. So we can do as much as we can to mitigate the health effect consequences, but that means that we have to have the resources and the ability to also protect the underserved and children and vulnerable populations. So in summary, wildfire chemical makeup and toxicity levels really depends on materials, temp, O2 and ventilation. It uh, is associated with inflammation related respiratory and cardiovascular effects. We need to have a better understanding of the chronic and acute effects of wildfires. There are vulnerable populations at risk, which we really do need to make sure that we address during any policy uh, changes that we can make here in the West, that the need to prevent is critical. We've talked about that today and interdisciplinary research and collaboration is very important. So what can we do? We can mitigate and stop global warming as well as create better policies for reducing density of forests and reducing diesel uh, use of fuel. We can build defenses and prepare for the consequences of climate change and fires and communicate to the public and the government, learn how to manage and provide care and access and engage communities. So I wanna thank you all and uh, appreciate talking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Kari, and thanks to Kimmy and Steve as well.
Um, we have a bit of time for some general discussion and several participants have already submitted questions and I'm going to try to get to those. But I thought, first of all, I'd give the three of you a chance to, if you have any comments or questions of one another. If not, we can go directly to the questions that our participants have sent in. All right, then. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question for Steve, if that's OK. No, please. Um, Steve, I, I love your historical content, which is so helpful. And in your, um, in your reference to the Native Americans, how many acres uh, did it in those ages, how many acres do you think we need to burn a year to be able to at least adjust to the dense forests that are currently with us? How many acres do the Native Americans, for example, burn if we even have that data? Well, we really don't have that data. Uh, we can make reasonable guesses at places, but we're probably talking about 10 times what we're seeing now would not be unreasonable. But a lot of the acreage that would have been available in pre-settlement times is now city, um, it's agriculture, it's something else. Um, but I, I don't think we really appreciate how much burning routine sort of low level burning, chronic burning went on. You can still see that in places like uh, Brazil. Uh, I've seen it in several West African countries and elsewhere. It's just spring cleaning. It's just something you just clean up the landscape and they're actually what, what they're often called are cleaning fires. But we don't have that. We have a sense of some kind of surf of flame going through. And it was just, it was more a kind of low grade herbivory. Uh, we have to get the landscape into a form that it can accept those kinds of fires. So it's a complicated problem. It's not beyond our ability to take on, but we're looking at, I would say, at least an order of magnitude larger than what we're doing now. Thank you. Um, so, so far, this has been pretty grim and gloomy. <laughs> not much good news has emerged from the discussion thus far. Um, but I have a question for uh, Kimmy. Uh, several people have put in, uh, sent in a question along these lines. Um, given the issues surrounding the WUI, the wilderness uh, urban interface, um, what about th their conceivable mitigating institutions like insurance companies, including medical insurance uh, enterprises like Medicare, who might have some kind of regulatory input to minimize the, the, the health damages, especially from, from uh, wildfires at, that, uh, at the urban interface? So can you say a little more about that, perhaps? Yes, certainly. Um, and I would also invite the other panelists to chime in here. But there, we have long relied on insurance companies to help account for additional mitigation measures or, or provide that regulatory mechanism that's needed to compel homeowners to, to build wildfire resistant homes and local municipalities to, to enforce those mitigation measures at neighborhood scales. And that's honestly, I I, I don't think we can rely on insurance companies to solve this problem. They can certainly be players and come to the table. But as I said earlier, leaking washing machines were far more of a problem for them than wildfires were up until recently. Hail damage still you know, makes wildfire costs pale in comparison. And so it's erroneous to assume that, wild, that insurance companies are going to bail us out of this situation. As I said, they're certainly a player at the table, but it comes down to all scales and all of the actors involved. So it includes homeowners having to accept a level of responsibility. It includes local municipalities to enforce those measures. And it requires a broader societal paradigm shift in how we understand increasing wildfire behavior. And as Steve Pine has noted, and I always love to say, is that you know from an urban planning perspective, we can actually solve this problem we have in the past. And so once we start to redefine what the problem is and look at it from an urban planning perspective, I think it actually provides some very tangible solutions to this challenge. Thank you, Kari. Do you um, want to add to that? Sorry? I was just going to ask if Steve or, or Kari wanted to add to that. No, I just reinforce it. The wildland urban interface, even its name, got defined by the wildland community, which saw the problem as one of houses encroaching on their wildlands. But we could have picked up the other end of that stick and said, this is really an urban uh, environment with funny landscaping. And if you define it that way, then it's pretty clear what you have to do. We solved the urban fire problem. Uh, in a sense, we misdefined the WUI. Now we're having to retrofit. 
Harry, I was particularly struck with your, if I'm summarizing your observation that uh, wildfires are not just about the woods anymore. <laughs> When you see that the Western smoke pollution actually gets as far as Massachusetts, that's pretty impressive. And I might add, your your presentation also reminded us that wildfires are not simply about the West anymore, if they ever were just about the West. I actually want to come back to that maybe at the end of our next session. Um, but maybe you could say a little bit about the subject you touched on that, to me at least, wasn't entirely clear. The different the different health effects of prescribed or controlled burns on the one hand and true wildfires on the other. Yeah, I think there's this thought that somehow prescribed burns in your community are going to increase asthma risk or increase issues around your health. And so some communities have not wanted to have them, or there's this perception by the California Air Resources Board districts that they don't want to have anything controversial in the communities. On one side, I understand that they have to be careful and make decisions around burn days, depending on the wind and other uh, geographical features. But on the other side, for those things that we can educate communities and say, you know, that it's okay to have a prescribed burn here and there, especially given the fact that communities are taught and told ahead of time about prescribed burns. They have the ability to leave their home during that time. Um, and in fact, it is a way to clean the forest. It's, it's a very helpful way so that we can stop having wildfire tornadoes and intense burns that can be very disastrous. So I'm hoping that communities see that the data currently are still lacking for the most part. We really need to study prescribed burns versus wildfires better. But for the cohorts that we've studied so far, there are definitely um, no long-term health issues with prescribed burns that we can see. And that's important because communities can see these as benefiting the environment and reducing the risk of wildfires in their communities. Carrie, as I understand it, and my understanding may be imperfect, and perhaps the second panel, just a few minutes, will get into this. But as I understand it, it's air quality control boards that have the most dispositive say about whether you can do a prescribed burn or not. If that's the case, should it remain the case, or should there be other voices of equal valence in that discussion? Um, David, it's an excellent point. I, I was also very uh, curious as to how decisions are made about burn days, and they are so district dependent, which then defines some of the issues here, because then people are making decisions not with consistent and systematic uh, methods. And so I, uh, I have myself written to the governor's office to try to see if we can create some other systematic statewide unit that decides upon burn days rather than leaving it up for the district and that we have a set of algorithmic decision tools to be able to help us know should we do burn days or not and how can they be helpful. So I'm hoping that this data that we are doing on the health side can help government officials make decisions, but I agree about what you're inferring. It would be better to have it statewide rather than district to district. People might disagree with me. I'm new to this, but um, I, I, it would be better to have more uh, transparent decision-making procedures. Well, our second panel, which will begin in just a few minutes, is actually, we're going to have three state officials. Okay, great. From Washington, California, and Colorado. And so maybe we can come to grips with this issue. But as a kind of transition to that, uh, one of our uh, participants, Greg Surya, has just put in a question to each of you very quickly, if you could answer it. If you could recommend just one policy change that would improve matters, just one, briefly, what would it be? Steve, you want to begin? Well, well fire is yeah. No, the fire is interactive, and I'm going to I'm going to fudge by saying there are two two easy things to target. One is what Kimmy talked about, namely hardening our communities. We know how to do that. That would reduce a huge amount of the risk. The other is fixing our electric grid, which we need to do anyway. Uh, that is the source of so many of the worst fires. So what's true in fire is that we don't necessarily need a trillion dollar program for fire. We need to fix a lot of other things of which fire is a part. Jimmy? 
what I'm going to say is probably not very palatable to a lot of people, but the one fix that might get to this is if you actually reverse the fiscal mechanisms in place at the federal level and the moral hazard in place to compel local and state government to actually have to pay for firefighting costs, guaranteed they would not be promoting development in wildfire prone areas if they had to foot the bill for it. So again, not very palatable and probably not very realistic, but it would address the moral hazard of allowing federal firefighters to protect homes that perhaps should not be there in the first place. Ari? Uh, of course, I, I agree with everything that's been said uh, as well as educate. Uh, I think we need to educate uh, more and more and have, have uh, sessions like this to help the community understand. And then lastly, of course, um, a zero emission policy. Uh, divesting from fossil fuel emissions and investing in greening and improving the planet to the extent that we don't create denser forests, but improvement of planetary health. All right. Well, I want to thank all three of you for getting us started here today. We're going to transition now to our second uh, panel. Uh, we have three very distinguished public servants with us. We have uh, Secretary uh, Wade Crowfoot, who is the Secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency will be with us, as well as Hillary Franz, who is the Commissioner of the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. And uh, Commissioner Franz was with us in Yakima, Washington at another State of the West Symposium a few years back. So we're welcoming you back to the Lane Center and we're welcoming you, Secretary Crowfoot, for the first time, but we hope not the last. Wade, maybe we can ask you to kick off and say a few things about the California fire situation, and in particular in this part of the panel, of course, given the fact that you were all three of you state officers, we're particularly interested in policy questions and especially realistic policy proposals for how to improve things going forward. So please take it away. Well, good to be with you. And it sounds like there's been a, a lively discussion already. And so I don't want to cover too much ground. You may have already covered in your discussion, but uh, let me say that it's um, it's an honor to be uh, presenting here with our, our colleagues from Washington and Colorado. Um, wildfire is, you know, a regional crisis across the West. Uh, as you point out, of course, Professor, it's not only the Western United States, but that is obviously where our catastrophic wildfire phenomenon is, is most severe. Uh, I found myself in a surreal uh, circumstance with President Trump last year of, of really making the case for the scientific basis of our worsening wildfire conditions. And it's worth just noting here, um, the way we describe our challenges in California is born from really two primary factors. Um, the first is uh, this policy of fire exclusion uh, and very little forest management um, for over the last century in, in our state. We had a whole lot of development uh, across our state and the uh, cutting of the first growth uh, of forests or ancient growth of forests a um, hundred years ago. And then since then, there's been very little vegetation management or uh, the small scale fire. So we have, uh, we have forests, we have landscapes in need of management, but also of course, we have to acknowledge the impact of climate change, specifically warming winter temperatures that dry out our soils and our forests and warming summer temperatures um, that allow for fires to get hotter and move faster. In fact, in California, uh, we broke records last summer uh, for what was, in essence, a heat storm across our state. Um, Death Valley very probably broke a world record for temperature over 130 degrees, but even greater Los Angeles over 120 degrees. So climate change, uh, historical uh, forest management practices have created what is a growing challenge in our state. Consider these facts. Uh, of the 20 largest wildfires in our state's 170 year history, 17 of the 20 largest fires occurred in the last two decades. Five of our six uh, largest fires in state history were burning at the same time last summer. So we're facing uh, obviously growing catastrophic uh, wildfire risk. And it sounds like that was well established in, in the panel that you just had. But let me talk about what we're doing about it. And I think it's cause for some optimism. Clearly in California, we are expanding our response capacity, um, building up CAL FIRE, which is in our agency, uh, to be even uh, faster uh, and more equipped to respond to fires. 
over 7,000 permanent employees in CAL FIRE that surges up to tens of thousands during the summer as a result of mutual aid. You know, I think we have in California one of the largest, most sophisticated wildland fighting, firefighting forces in the country, if not the world. And we're continuing to invest in that, more boots on the ground, more technology, more uh, airplanes and helicopters. But let's be honest, we are not going to respond our way uh, out of this crisis. We have to do much more, I would say, take a quantum leap of action and investment in proactive upfront measures to reduce the risks, reduce the impacts of catastrophic wildfire in the first place. And that's really where uh, a lot of our energy is focused right now. It starts with uh, a deepening partnership between our state and our federal agencies. As you all know, across the West, much of our forests, much of our landscapes are under federal management. Um, in California, about 57% of our forests are federally managed. Um, California, our state government only own, owns about 3% of the forest, but we're responsible for the other 43% of, of wildland fires. So improving coordination between our US Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management and CAL FIRE and other state agencies is critical. Most states in the West have signed a shared stewardship agreement um, in the last uh, presidential administration that really focuses on how the, how the two uh, levels of government are gonna work more closely together. In California, our land use or our land ownership is in many respects a patchwork. So if we don't have our federal firefighters, our state firefighters and forest managers working together, we're not actually gonna uh, address the crisis. We also need to invest a whole lot more money in uh, upfront work um, versus response. Consider this fact, the, re, the toxic removal from the campfire, which destroyed paradise, um, ha, has cost over $2 billion. That's simply to remove uh, the toxic materials from um, the, the burned out homes and buildings in paradise, not to mention all of the rebuilding, $2 billion from that one, one, uh, one fire. Before the last couple of years, we were spending only tens of millions of dollars on these upfront actions. So that's changed. This year, Governor Newsom in January proposed $1 billion of one-time spending on wildfire resilience. Um, that's not, that's not uh, cannibalizing CAL FIRE's response budget, but rather um, increased investment in the actions that we need to take. Really, uh, in, in essentially, uh, in three concentric circles. As your speakers in the last panel talked about, we need to make more investments within communities to make them wildfire resilient. So that includes hardening homes, um, strengthening defensible space, uh, uh, improving evacuation planning and community response, hardening infrastructure, creating places of refuge. So there needs to be more uh, upfront uh, spending within communities. That's that sort of tightest concentric circle. We're also spending significant investment around communities. So think about your emergency fire break around communities that will either stop or importantly, slow down fire uh, from coming into communities. Governor Newsom actually took the remarkable action of waiving any en environmental review last year on the most critical of these emergency fuel break projects around communities. And they actually, in the last wildfire season, in many instances, made a difference protecting those communities. And then the broadest concentric circle is, of course, the work that we need to do across our landscapes, our forested landscapes in the Sierra and the North Coast, our oak woodland landscapes in the Central Valley's uh, foothills, and of course, our chaparral landscapes in Southern California. Um, and in the forest, obviously, that means uh, more vegetation management or ecologically appropriate thinning. It certainly means more prescribed fire, which is, of course, what your last panel uh, touched on. In other environments, for example, Southern California chaparral, it's less about um, vegetation management and more about wildfire breaks and uh, investment around uh, communities. So billion dollars of investment, a uh, federal state partnership uh, signed last year, the Shared Stewardship Agreement. We're holding ourselves accountable in California for uh, a set of actions that we uh, put together in a wildfire and forest resilience action plan. 
that we released in January along with the budget. That action plan uh, makes a couple of paradigm shifts uh, from the past. First, it basically elevates the importance of regional leadership building wildfire resilience. In California, we cannot export one size fits all solutions from Sacramento. Um, the wildfire challenges in urban and suburban LA are very different than rural Sierra Nevada or even the Bay Area. And so our action plan and the proposed investment is focused on building up um, regional priorities. In other words, ensuring that there's strong planning among uh, regional entities, cities, counties, state agencies, federal agencies operating there, and then prioritizing projects to actually fund. And then this billion dollars of one-time investment will get spent over the next five to seven years actually funding that pipeline of projects, whether it's prescribed fire, emergency fuel breaks, uh, defensible space work in communities. And that's a pretty significant uh, shift. The other shift is getting away from this one-time sort of episodic funding of projects. I think if we're actually gonna make a difference reducing our catastrophic wildfire risk, we have to make a sustained effort over time, which is why we spread out this proposed billion dollars um, uh, over five to seven years. Um, that, that funding proposal is current before, currently before our state legislature and looking like there's really strong alignment on that amount of funding actually being needed to uh, build our wildfire resilience. I guess last point I'd make is success isn't eradicating wildfire, right? That's a lesson we've already learned. We need to, wherever possible, reintroduce uh, low level prescribed fire. And in fact, that's a practice that we've learned from our tribal partners um, that ha help them steward California's environment since time immemorial. So we have to allow for more fire to get back uh, on the landscape in a healthy way and recognize that fire is part of our natural ecology in California and throughout the West. However, given climate change and the potential for these fires to burn almost uncontrollably and decimate communities, uh, cause fatalities, destroy ecosystems, we have to do more to allow those fires that start and grow every year to, to um, retain sort of a manageable size and impact. So success in a decade in California won't look like the absence of wildfire season. We'll continue to have wildfire season, but our goal is to make that a manageable wildfire season, minimizing public health and safety risks and enabling healthy landscapes and ultimately a healthy environment. So really excited to be here with you uh, and I'll turn it back over to you at this point. Thank you, Wade. Uh, Governor Polis, I'm going to ask you to go next. By default, we're proceeding in alphabetical order by names of states, California, Colorado, and we'll get to Washington. And if I can be just briefly permitted a personal note, Governor, uh, I heard you speak on this subject at the Western Governors Association meeting a few, several weeks back, and I was quite impressed with what you had to say, and that's why we extended the invitation here. But I also want to say that I think, I believe I speak for everyone in attendance here today in extending our Sympathy to you and everybody in Colorado for the terrible ordeal that you've just uh, gone through. So we're, we're particularly grateful that you're taking the time to be with us today. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. I just came from the uh, funeral of Officer Tally, who was um, who leaves behind uh, a wife and seven kids. Um, uh, was uh, one of the ten people lost at the uh, King King Super shooting, responding to the call. Um, Thanks for the introduction. It's absolutely crucial that Western states work together. Um, Colorado had not one, not two, but the three largest wildfires in the entire history of our state all last year. Um, it was a devastating wildfire season, about 600,000 acres. It's Cameron Peak Fire, 208,000 acres. East Troublesome, 193,000. Pine Gulch, 139,000. Uh, it's consecutive challenges uh, with a uh, statewide drought um, and the situation that we have uh, as well. Um, but we know that, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the heroic uh, actions of our firefighters and modern technology, it actually would have been even worse. It's also important to know kind of where we are with the changing climate. The 20 largest fires in Colorado history have all occurred in the last 20 years. Now, there's two factors in that. One is changing climate. 
The other is demographics, more people, more utilization, uh, more risks of, of, um, of campers and, and others um, that um, can start fires. In fact, the very, very term fire season doesn't even seem to capture the, the nearly full year of fire risk. Um, even uh, last November, we saw two grass fires in Colorado. While I was hearing Wade's speech, I was just looking at a report that there's another fire now in, in Colorado. Uh, it's really um, year round. And uh, that's an impact of climate change that leads a longer burning period. Uh, it's certainly one of the reasons our administration, working with other Western states, federal government takes climate change seriously. Uh, but we know that in the meantime, we have to deal with uh, a more robust and aggressive action to contain fires before they get out of control. Colorado has seen a significant increased growth in the wildland urban interface, a lot more people living uh, in and around wild spaces. Uh, and we need strategic landscape style uh, scale investments to reduce wildfire risk as well as flood risks and protect and preserve our, our watershed quality and health. Uh, just in the last few weeks, we've been working with our legislature. I've signed several bills that have scaled, scaled up our response. We created the Colorado Firefighting Air Corps Fund uh, to purchase new aircraft. Um, we also uh, signed a wild, wildlife uh, risk mitigation grant fund uh, and working with the Water Conservation Board Construction Fund. So uh, taking a lot of those steps that we need to, but we need to act with urgency. Our strong federal partners uh, in Colorado, uh, our three fires were largely on federal land. Some of them, uh, both, one of them BLM, two of them uh, US Forest Service Department of Ag. Obviously they swept in a little bit of private and a little bit of state land too, but uh, our federal partnership is absolutely critical. Uh, in this stewardship. Our state is uh, almost half owned by the federal government and uh, most of the areas that, that tend to burn are, are the uh, the western part of our state owned by uh, owned by the federal government. So that's absolutely critical and that partnership between federal, state, intrastate, right, um, in the west and local is really an important approach to figure out how to do this. So we need to act with urgency to prepare ourselves to quickly address the immediate threats of wildfires, act early when they start, prevent them uh, in the first place through scientifically driven forest health practices, of course, climate change mitigation, adaptation efforts, and engaging and educating the public through increased education and management. So uh, this is really in the forefront of minds of, of all of our Western states. I wanna thank you, David, for helping to convene this and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. And now, uh, thank you, Governor. <clears throat> and now if we can move to Washington State, Hillary France, please take it away. Give us the Pacific Northwest perspective. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that kind of introduction. And big thank you for Bill Lane Center for American West for inviting me to participate in this important panel. It was great to actually hear from California and Colorado. Um, I'm honored to be able to talk about, I think, what is one of the most pressing issues facing the West Coast. Um, as the Commissioner of Public Lands, I manage 6 million acres of land, water, and natural resources on behalf of the people of Washington. I also lead our state's wildfire fighting force. And in this role, I've seen firsthand the destruction wildfire inflicts, destruction that's escalating year after year. I've also seen the proactive stay, steps that we can and must take to change the trajectory of danger and destruction we're on. In Washington state, they say, is this our new normal? Can you do anything to change this normal? Um, and we believe we can, but and we believe we don't have any time to waste. We've helped develop sort of the blueprint and the tools to better protect our forests and communities. Some of the speakers have spoken to that, and we believe we have the plans in place. And now what we need is action, it, uh, and action now. It was interesting hearing uh, Mr. Crowfoot talk about a $1 billion investment. I'm just begging for $125 million for two years uh, to fight these fires. The first part of tackling our wildfire crisis is acknowledging the problem. And it is become very clear that it is not a one year thing. It is an annual issue across the West Coast that will continue to grow in scope and danger if we don't do anything. In Washington, 1600 wildfires burned more than 810,000 acres, making it the worst year for wildfire since the record setting 1 million acres in 2015. I wanna tell everybody and remind them we're the evergreen state and we're trying to prevent it from becoming the charcoal black state. We have the bulk of those acres of 820,000 acres, more than 600,000 acres burned in just 72 hours starting on Labor Day. 
hot, dry conditions fueled by hurricane force winds spread at an unpredictable pace. Almost 300 homes lost. Entire communities were leveled. Um, just a short drive from our urban centers of Seattle and Tacoma. And we tragically lost the first life. A little boy, his, his family tried to outrun those fires. Now we know those numbers are far worse than the California and Colorado and even Oregon over the last few years. But the fact is it's only gonna grow for us just as it's grown for our Southern states. And the reality is in Washington state, we have failed to invest. We have skeleton crews on the ground and in the air. I have 11 helicopters to fight these fires in every corner of the state. Over 72 fires in 24 hours, 10 of them fought in the Vietnam War. That's how underinvested we are. Many uh, of the homeowners that lost their homes, no insurance. I had firefighters fighting fires for 96 hours. And when we put out the call to the federal government and to other states for mutual aid, we come up short because so many of those resources are already deployed in our Southern states of California and Oregon and Colorado and others. In 2017, when we needed resources to fight these fires, we had to go to Australia. That's the closest we could find of any firefighters, um, which we know we've sent to other states and other countries. The fact is every one of our states have to become more resilient on themselves. That's what California is doing. That's what Colorado is calling out for. I know Oregon is stepping up. We need still our federal agency partners, but we also need to become more resilient on ourselves. So here's what we've been doing. Um, first and foremost, we are making finally the investments we have to be making in our resources. We cannot continue to say we're going to rely on the assistance of the federal government. We're going to rely on the assistance of other states. Um, we are right now are putting forward one of the most ex, uh, significant investment requests to the legislature of $125 million of biennium in a dedicated revenue source. And it would go to three major buckets if we're going to change the trajectory we're on. One is in wildfire response. We have to expand and modernize our wildfire fighting resource to keep fires small and contained. Those air resources are critical on initial attack and getting on those fires quickly and containing them so we can move on to the next one and we can also reduce the damage to the environment, to people's lives and to our economy. We have to also be investing in our local firefighting resources. Many of the firefighting departments we have in our state that are on the front lines of wildfire are volunteer firefighting teams. Many of them are past retirement or near retirement. We have not trained the next level of firefighters. And we know when you fight fires, you don't learn by a book. You actually learn on the ground. Mm -hmm. We also need to be investing in incident management teams. These are the incident management teams across the nation that are responding to fires. We have 17 for the entire country. They respond to hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, wildfires, and COVID. Every health disaster, every natural resource disaster. And when we were in this last 2020 Labor Day firestorm, the fact is, is we couldn't get any incident management team to our state. They were already fully deployed. So we had, instead of a type two or type one, which is 50 to 75 plus member crew, we had best of 15 to 17, and we still didn't have enough. We had to go to a regional firefight, and we were so close to having to change the entire way we fight fires because those resources. That is something that we know those incident management teams are critical, not just for wildfire, but they're critical for every single human health and natural resource disaster we have in Washington State, and we know we're seeing more of those. And we need to be training them now because we don't have time to waste because it builds that expertise over time. In addition, the forest restoration is absolutely critical. If we're gonna stop moving and constantly be in a reactive phase, we've gotta get at a proactive. We're gonna spend the money either way. The question is we're gonna spend the money by throwing money, taxpayer dollars into flames, or we're gonna invest up front and restore the health of our forest to make them more resilient. We developed a 20 year forest health plan that would have us treating over 1.25 million acres just in Eastern Washington alone over the next 20 years about 70,000 acres a year. We're being agnostic to property lines because fire and disease do not follow property lines. Um, we can, are making rapid scale investments in those landscapes, but we only have so much money as afforded to us by either our legislature or the federal government. 
I think, and some of the speakers before this mentioned it, I think some of the biggest challenges we face, environmental review and litigation. And let me tell you, I'm an environmental attorney who comes from the environmental community. And the fact is that we're watching our forests burn at an unbelievable pace and scale, destroying fish and wildlife habitat. We've got to go faster. In addition to that, we don't have the trained workforce to actually be able to do not only prescribed fire, but the forest health treatments. We have an unemployment challenge and a need for more people who are trained. We have got to bridge that gap. And I think COVID actually gives us that opportunity to do that. Um, in addition to that, we if we're gonna move at the pace and scale of wildfire on forest health, there are impacts like slash piles, those giant slash piles that right now we can't respond fast enough to it. So either nature burns it, because we can't burn it fast enough before nature does, we should be looking at the economic opportunities that can come from that. Like cross laminate timber, we have now have two of the largest cross laminate timber, mass timber facilities that have opened in Washington state because we made a commitment to treat enough forest health to provide product to them so they can make those investments. That's addressing the environmental crisis and our rural economic crisis. The slash piles is another opportunity for more clean energy sources in biomass as well as biochar, which we are exploring, investigate, and investing in. The third piece is community resilience. Um, I know California has been hit some of the hardest in this country year after year. Our state, we remember the images of Paradise, California, and I will say many of the people of Washington State, two million of them are at risk, would say that could never happen in Washington State. We are the rainy, cold, wet state, but it did. Last year, we lost the entire town of Malden. And we have communities that are even higher risk than Paradise, California, Washington State. Um, and we believe we can change the trajectory they're on by making the investments in these communities, the fuel breaks. So we're going and working to starting by identifying the red communities, the ones that are not politically red, but are fire hot red. And we're going in and going and launching a new campaign. It will launch literally next week called Wildfire Ready Neighbors, where we are going to do a mass exodus, a mass effort to be able to take those red communities and turn them green. So they're not in danger. Everything from the home to the neighborhood to the fuel breaks around the community. Um, we believe that we have the blueprints to do it. Right now we are in a fight to make sure we have the funding resources so these don't just become plans that sit on a shelf. Dreams that we all think will save money and save lives but actually that we can put to implementation. And I wanna thank California and Colorado, not only for your heroism and all the unbelievable work, but we are you know, learning from you as well. Um, and um, I look forward to continue partnership and work together because I think we need each of us to be able to work together to get there faster for our people. Thank you very much, uh, Hillary. As you know, Washington is my home state, so I'm particularly Happy to hear a report from that region. Uh, Wade, if I can ask you, all three of you have touched a little bit on what I first heard of uh, as being called the good neighbor agreement, but I think you called it the stewardship, common stewardship agreement or worse that effect. Maybe Wade, could you explain a little bit more about that and how, to what degree that agreement addresses the uh, deficient resources problem? Sure, so as I know it, good neighbor authority enables our federal agencies and state agencies to actually work across uh, jurisdictions on these forest management projects. And as I said, you know, in our state in any way, but I imagine in other states too, uh, land ownership patterns are in a patchwork. In other words, you could have, you know, state responsibility area right next to federal responsibility area and then a, a mile later back to state responsibility area. So before there was good neighbor authority to actually work across jurisdictions, um, it was really, uh, the efforts were really patchwork. So the Good Note Bear Authority is essentially a legal agreement that allows us to spend our, our, our state monies uh, and state personnel into federal land and vice versa. The broader shared stewardship agreement um, is this state and federal agreement that touches at a very high level on all of the area various points of coordination. Um, and so our shared stewardship agreement, for example, commits our state and the federal agencies each to, man to do vegetation management projects on 500,000 acres per year each, up to a million acres. Also shared mapping on priority projects. And then advancing and expanding the good neighbor authority is part of that. In, 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 in the context of that authority or the agreement that led to it, 
Uh, did it in any way touch the uh, operation or the, the operating procedures of the interagency fire center in Boise? I visited there several years ago and I was struck at the fact that it was a, an acephalic organization. There's no real top-down coordination of anything. It was just a place where people swapped resources around and talked to each other, but no, it didn't really have management responsibilities as far as I could see. Well, I would, I would maybe defer to Hillary as it relates to you know fe state federal coordination on fire response. I think that's gotten better, but as she points out, you know, frankly, the scale of the crisis, the scale of these wildfires is over, overwhelming our response capacity. So while we share resources across states and across jurisdictions, um, no doubt there's opportunity, one, to invest in more response, but then better coordination. The Good Neighbor Authority is a little bit one of these tools in the toolbox to expand our upfront proactive wildfire resilient actions to try to avoid those situations from happening in the first place. Yeah. That's true. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll add to that. So first, Good Neighbor Authority shared stewardship. Um, one of the things that's exciting is our land, and I manage six million acres of land, is adjacent to our federal land. And too often what happens is we'll do the work on our state land, but the federal land hasn't and the area still burns or is at threat. We also believe we can get greater efficiencies and economies of scale. If I've already got boots on the ground doing the work on our land, let me just cross over that boundary line and do it on federal land. Um, I think we, the great thing is it was launched roughly in 2017. It's made huge um, efforts, but we still need resources at the federal level to be investing in getting those contracts done at a faster level. We need the projects to be at much larger scale. And I, I looked at California, we launched a, a larger project up here in the um, Washington state. Unfortunately, it faced litigation, but of doing larger, like 10,000 acres, not 800 acres, right? So we can get there faster. Faster. We also find that there are different regions with different philosophies, and we honestly need sort of every region of the federal government within our states to be sort of working in lockstep with each other so they can work better in lockstep with us. Um, that's my candid opinion. Shared stewardship, I think another great thing about it is it's not just forest restoration to Mr. Crowfoot's uh, comment, salmon habitat restoration, recreation trails. It's really truly linking up the landscape, not based on ownership, but based on what are the results we want to achieve. Wildfire response is totally separate from that. And I think, I think we need to be working more aggressively at lifting up the state's voices in the West um, as to what is needed in wildfire response that we don't have enough air resources, frankly, to go around from the federal government. And they should be making those critical investments. And number one, number two, I, and I may be outspoken on this, I am very concerned about the movement to manage fire in certain environments and certain circumstances by the federal government on federal lands. We were fortunate this last year or Oregon was not, we could have had just as horrific a situation. And I think there needs to be a large conversation about that. Um, and, um, and then I think it's, ideally we would be in a way as a block of states saying, here's the true wildfire resources we're gonna need at all levels. Here's what we can do on our own. Here's what we can do through mutual aid between states. And here's where we need the feds to be investing so no one comes up short. Wade, one of our participants asks about the, uh, as I take a newly created uh, uh, office of chief fire technology officer. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and uh, what that promises for the future. Yeah, well, our governor, Gavin Newsom, has, has long leaned forward pretty aggressively on applying technology across government, right, to better deliver services. And firefighting and forest management is no different. There's a lot of emerging technology that we can actually utilize both to improve our ability to respond to fires, um, identify fires early and then control them, but then also manage our forest. So we brought on a chief technology officer and recruited one of our best and brightest within state government to actually bring a lot more focus, a lot more targeted strategic investment to build those technologies. So now we actually have the men and women that are on the front lines and their commanders are actually using um, satellite-based um, uh, tablets, for example, that are tracking fires, fire behavior using you know, newly created scientific algorithms. We're doing more advanced LIDAR across our state to really prioritize those most vulnerable areas. 
the idea is we're trying, and, and I should lastly say, we created this procurement sprint to try to reduce barriers to entry for technology companies that wanted to sell technology to us, strengthening the connection between Silicon Valley and Cal Fire in fighting uh, fires. Well, understandably, both you, Wade, and you, Hillary, are talking a lot about fire suppression. But the other side of the coin, of course, is fire prevention. So where, where does technology enter the picture on that side of the ledger? Well, you want, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I defer to... Go for it. I think you're way ahead on technology. Remember, I got Vietnam War helicopters I'm fighting these fires with. Well, um, we... <laughs> I think we'll, 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 we'll do more to share kind of our, our different assets across the state. We're really excited with these new helicopters that we're actually getting in uh, this year uh, that are coming in actually from Colorado. Um, but well, one, I mean, I think, you know, much, you know, in a much more sophisticated way, understanding the landscapes that we have to manage. And that's where remote imaging is actually so important. And whether it's satellite based imaging or LIDAR, it's really understanding what are the density of our forests. Um, and um, what do we need the density of our forests to be? Um, we also, so that's one uh, element of technology. We're also working to better quantify the carbon sequestration potential of our forests. In other words, the ability, what, what our forests do, removing carbon from the atmosphere. We're spending a lot of resources on our climate action and our re effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in California, and we're really proud of that. But at the same time, we have to maximize the ability of our lands to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And the challenge is, last summer, for example, our forests were not a, were, our forests were not a carbon sink, removing carbon from an atmosphere. They were carbon source, uh, polluting the atmosphere. Uh, and so that's another area, is really understanding that the, the climate potential or carbon potential of our forests, ultimately creating monetary incentives to manage our forests. So any number of technology applications for the upfront proactive actions to, to reduce wildfire risk. I'd like to bring- uh, And I'll just add- Sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna add for us, I, I, you know, the a big, we're using the LIDAR for the forest health and the carbon sequestration. I think that's great for Mr. Crowfoot to point that out. I think our big piece right now is we are too slow to find out when fires strike. We are still using outdated technology and slow technology um, and need actually to bring the satellite investment and infrastructure in. And that's part of what our legislative ask is. Go ahead. Well, I'd like to bring uh, Kimi back into the discussion briefly uh, because you said, Kimi, in the last part of this discussion, the first panel, that you thought your suggestion of more local responsibility and less federal presence would be unpopular. But I hear all three of these state officials who've spoken in this part of the panel uh, say that that's actually one of the frontline solutions to all this. Can you can you want to comment on that? Well, you know, it's it's it comes down to the moral hazard of of local municipalities and and local elected officials. Right now, there's not a lot of fiscal incentive for them to want to not approve a development in a high wildfire prone area because, you know, that's going to increase property revenue. It's it's good for their local economy certainly, um, but it translates that accountability on to federal land management agencies and firefighters who you know historically have been the ones that have to protect those homes that are placed in wildfire prone areas uh, and and then us largely as a society the federal taxpayers who have to foot that bill so there's the moral hazard and, and the implications that come with that and so certainly if you start to look at that from a fiscal policy perspective and shifting some of that accountability to local government uh, and it would certainly compel them to think differently about how they approve developments in places that are, are at hazard to wildfire. So it's, it's unpalatable because I think talking to a county commissioner and telling them that they're going to have to start footing the bill for some of the firefighting costs is, is the area that, you know, we, you have to approach cautiously. But I think given... Yeah, just, it, lo it locates the incentives in the right place. It does. Yes, it, it certainly does, but it you know it's it's one of those things that it's going to require a broader shift to look at this much more from a societal perspective and and trying to redefine the problem and and the paradigm that is around wildfire risks and home development in the first place. So you know there's also a lot of housing affordability questions and where are homes supposed to go if they can't go in some of these wildfire prone areas. So I don't want to simplify and make that challenge. Um, reduce it to something as easy as saying that, well, local governments to have to start paying for it. That's not what I'm saying. 
but it, I think we need to closely examine where the incentives are to try and compel them to think differently about the problem. Can I, can I jump in? Please. Okay, great. And, and I'm a former local government official, now a state official. And um, so I think that it, absolutely there needs to be a focus on land use decisions happening at the local level and whether we're increasing an, a problem that is already bad. Right, putting more people's lives in jeopardy with the wildland urban phase and zoning. Um, and I say that especially in light of COVID, where you know, I'm sure other states are experiencing this, we're experiencing, we're, we're seeing more and more people leaving the cities and moving out into the rural areas and into natural resource, beautiful forest lands and et cetera, because they can all this and they can work and go to school from anywhere. Um, so I say that recognized, but I do think it is absolutely critical that we take a, a moment to say everyone in our state is impacted by fires. Well, this has largely been a central and Eastern issue and our most rural communities are on the front lines of these wildfires. We two of the last three years have had the worst air quality in the world from Spokane to Seattle. And I spent an enormous amount of time with legislators saying, well, why should I pay for this? Why should my taxpayers pay for this when wildfire isn't coming to Seattle? It's not gonna be in Tacoma for a long time, right? The fact is we are all impacted. We're either impacted by the air quality or we're impacted by the increased greenhouse gas emissions that, or we're impacted by the amount of taxpayer dollars because we're spending on average now almost growing 200 million a year, which I know is small compared to California and other states, you know, that's throwing money into flames. We all are paying the price of these wildfires. We all should be invested. And the place that we should be thinking about making those investments is in our local fire districts. And the reason is if we look at any natural disaster or human health disaster like COVID, who are on the front lines are first responders. And many of these communities, at least in Washington, are volunteer fire districts with little resources because they have zero to small taxpayer base. They do. They are so unemployed and have so few resources that even an increase of small, and the reality is the more we're investing in those local, we make those communities stronger and healthier for any kind of disaster or challenge. We also, those are the fire districts that know their community best. They know the landscape base. They know how the fire has moved the last time. They know how to get on it quicker. And we need to be building up that talent in the local community, not just leaving it to the feds or to the states to handle alone. We're approaching the end of our allotted time here. So I'd like to put one last question to our two state officials. So with us, Governor Polis, I'm told, had to leave us a little bit early for a personal reason. Uh, but both uh, Wade and Hillary, I'd just like you to briefly, if you could, answer the, the question, where do you think are best practices uh, in this general uh, context of fire management? And I, and I hope you'll let your imagination range outside the United States, uh, Australia, Brazil, Canada. I mean, who does it better than we do? What, where, where are places we should try to emulate, if any? Well, I'd answer that by saying, you know, that we have to learn from each other and that, you know, failure would be if we're staying in our own jurisdictions, our own state, um, without actually understanding what's working in other parts of the world. Hillary mentioned Australia. You know, Australia has a lot to teach us about wildfire response and wildfire management. I would argue that American states have some to teach uh, Australia as well. We had Israeli firefighters uh, this last season. Our, our colleagues in Mexico actually have been very helpful in terms of sending um, uh, firefighters. And, you know, you learn that, that um, different jurisdictions, different countries, different states do it differently and really learning more from one another. I would definitely echo what Hillary and, and Governor Polis said about um, learning, you know, sort of banding together in the West and learning from each other. Um, I also think we have a stronger voice in, in the discussion with the federal uh, government when we come together as a state. So I know, you know, every season we're learning from our partners like Washington State and then hopefully sharing lessons learned as well. Hillary? I agree completely. I do think we, I would just add, I think we have a lot to learn from our tribal communities. The, our tribal communities have been leading in the area of forest management, prescribed fire. We're trying to bring that back. We're challenged by a policies and statutes we've adopted a long time ago to stop it all. And we're trying to unravel those. 
Um, and I think that's a big piece of it. Um, I think also, I'm just going to put this out there and, you know, we are the evergreen state and it shocks me how little investments we make at the local state level in our forests. Everything from preventing the conversion of those forests to recognizing them as absolutely essential, not on, only for our clean water and our clean air, but actually for our built environment, for our economies. Um, and I think, you know, places like Sweden that has built an entire culture around their forest as a value, not only environmentally, but economically and the sustainability of it, carbon sequestration, all the way to preventing those fires. You know, I think there's, I'm shocked, I'll be just last piece. It amazes me. We have a number of carbon bills going through our legislature right now. And largely it's transportation, 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 transportation. Not, it is so hard to get them recognizing the value of force as a climate defense and a climate offense. Um, and I think we have a long ways to go and we, there's other countries that have been leading in that effort. So look, I'd like to thank you, Wade Crowfoot and Hillary France for sharing some time with us today. And thank you, uh, Kari Nado and Steve Pine and Kimiko Barrett for the same reason. Uh, I'd like to conclude this with a couple of brief comments. So, one, um, just referencing what uh, Kari had to say about how fire issues are not just about the woods anymore and not just about the West anymore. Uh, in a sense, uh, Kari, when you said that, you've touched on one of the informing principles of the Lane Center's programs uh, across all kinds of issues is that we think the West can be a place where we can develop best practices and they can be exported to other regions and places that share some of the issues that are so characteristic of our region, not least of all, not, not just wildfire, but also water management and energy issues. Uh, they all have a peculiar incidence in our region. And in fact, I'll use that as just a reminder to tell you all that on May 13th, we will have the third of this year's State of the West uh, Symposia managed by the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, which will focus on water and energy issues. So thank you all for your participation. I've learned some things. I've, I went into today's discussion thinking that <clears throat> more federal presence was the solution, but I'm coming away thinking that's not quite the answer. So thank you all very much. And uh, Wade, I'll see you in Evolution Valley in a few months. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.